But the, the, the nice thing was, commanders were telling us, uh, people back in the States, what was going on. We were sending parties over analyzing. There was constant anal uh, look at what was going on with, uh, with the Sherman tank and the way it was fighting. And at the end of the day, it helped win the war. Okay, before Dave throws me out. How did doctrine influence the development of the Sherman? Numbers. Uh, but I'm, I'm driving at the tank destroyer doctrine kind of kept us away from developing early on a tank that could destroy another tank. And that probably delayed, we probably would have come up with the idea we needed the long 76 with uh, maybe a year or two. I, I think that's, that, that's one of the problems. And also early on, uh, we didn't really have a good tank doctrine until we saw what was actually happening in warfare. How did resources and industrial capacity affect the development of the Sherman in the beginning, especially? It's, it was what? just like you flick a switch, turn on the faucet, and boom, there you go. I mean, we were able to, you know, I, to be producing the first tank as the blueprints are still damp. Yeah. You know, so you know, because of our industrial ability, and God bless KT Keller, you know, we were able to get stuff up and moving, and because of you know, our industrial base, we could react quickly to issues as well. So they kind of say, this isn't working, so okay, we do that now. And you can do it as, you're, as it's moving out on. It, it was truly the mother of necessity. We had to get something, we had to get it now, we had to get it fast, and we did it. How did threat and combat experience develop, uh, affect the development of the Sure, I just talked about that. We're not sure that the threat really informed us by our intelligence, but we knew what the threat did by seeing what it did to us. When it started destroying our tanks, we knew we had to make it. We had to make a change. Was the Sherman the best tank of World War II? How many hand, How many people changed their minds? Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, what can you learn from this? Well, you had a great presentation. <laughs> what this is your main how do we stack up today compared to then? Did we learn anything? Bingo, yes, we have. And you know what we've done? We have, a, we have a place over there called the U.S. Army Tank Automotive Command that constantly is doing this kind of analysis and this kind of work. We, are, we develop our tank now before we need it. The M, the, we are about to come out with the M1A3. They have finally made the decision to make another version of the Abrams tank that's going to be even better than the current version. We're going to do a new, a new uh, the M1, M109A7. This is also a testament to how good this stuff was designed, because the M109 came out when I was born in 1960, okay? And we're still using the basic chassis up to this day. We know how to improve. We know how to make better. We don't wait until we need it. That's the point. That's what we learned. Our ingenuity allowed us to actually do pretty good. But we could have done better. And we don't need to be caught going, you know what, we need a tank yesterday. We need to combat something or another yesterday. That's what the lesson is of the, the Sherman tank program. Because what if they didn't do it right? What if the only thing they could have come up with was the M3 lean go, man, that's what we're gonna use. Okay. Yeah, we're we're right. Yeah. We're we're constantly trying to improve and make better and whatnot. What's funny though is when the M ramps came out, that was actually kind of the same thing. Uh-oh, the Humvee's getting blown up. So we need something to transport our troops around this kind of environment. And that's what happened. Any more questions before, uh, before we conclude? Thank you very much, sir. If anyone has any more, we all have some great questions. If anyone has any more questions, Fred, you want to give me your uh, email address or something like that? Contact you if they have Um, sure. My email address is blackcloud6. It's a, a word, one word, at comcast.net. And I'll try to answer anything I want. And that one gentleman who had a bunch of questions. Are, am I related to FAM Schwartz? No, I wish I was. <laughs> the gas mileage for the Sherman was seven miles a gallon. 
there on the other. It's like my van. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any Shermans on display in any nearby military museums? Uh, no, but there's one down in, near Gross Eel Island. Well, there's, uh, and there's a, there's a couple up north. And there's I one at Fort Wayne. Yeah. Uh, there's Grand Rapids. You're in Grand Rapids. It's a 105 at Fort Wayne. It's a, a 105. Uh, Did the gunner sit directly behind the breach? No, he sat to the um, He sat to the left behind the commander. The commander sat behind him. He, he sat to the left. No, you don't want to be behind the breach. The breach moves about that far. It might hit you somewhere. <laughs> What was the number one design priority? Reliability, mobility, fire control, survivability, crew comfort. I would say none of the above. It was producibility. We had to make them. What is the distinction between a 75 and general purpose gun and a 75 dual purpose gun? A general purpose gun is usually used just with high explosive rounds. A dual purpose gun will fire both types of ammunition, anti-tank and uh, high explosive. What was the M4's number one mission? To break through and get to the enemy's rear and cause havoc. My grandfather worked at the Warren Tank that World War II. He was an immigrant from Transylvania. Okay. Where can I ship? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. 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 Th